Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Don't work, while only, uh, don't only work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. You should embrace your role as a slave. That was Paul's message to the Christians, many of whom really were slaves in the church at Ephesus. The slave population in the Roman Empire was somewhere between 10% and 33% of, the, of, of everybody. Uh, you know, they don't have perfect records, but somewhere between one in 10 and one in three were slaves in a Roman city. Probably quite a few members of the church were from this group. After many words promising God's power and his using you in his unfolding work in the cosmos, after hearing how Jesus Christ breaks down all the walls and, and brings everyone together and grants us access to himself and empowers us and gives us hope and purpose and so much more, now Paul says right to their faces, be the best slave you can be. If you were actually a slave, how might that make you feel? There's been several moments in this book, you know, in this letter where I think if we were sitting there listening for the first time, hearing it read, you know, hands would go up and say, excuse me, what did you just say? And we've talked about how so much of it was countercultural and how so much of it was completely different to uh, what the human mind thinks and expects and what we're used to. If you were actually a slave hearing these words. But did you notice? Paul didn't just say it to actual slaves. He included the free men and women too. He included masters as well. And as a matter of fact, he includes all of us because this holy inspired book is for you and for me as well. Now, the good news is, or at least the kind of evens the playing field, is that Paul includes himself as well. In fact, Paul and James and Peter and Jude and Timothy all identify themselves as slaves of God, using the exact same word Paul is using here in their New Testament writings. And so God's not asking, the apostles aren't asking anything of you and me that they didn't apply to themselves. Now, we live in a culture that prizes, almost worships personal freedom, personal liberty, my rights, right? It's baked into our American mentality. And don't get me wrong, for the record, I'm extremely glad that we live in a very free society, relatively speaking, and compared to most of human history, one of the freest societies of all time. But the truth is, if you're a Christian here tonight, you and I should embrace our roles as slaves to God. The biblical perspective on life, even daily life, just regular day-to-day -day life, is that we are God's children and we are his friends, but we are also his bond servants. Maybe when I read those verses a moment ago, your version, if you're following along, had the term bond servants instead of slaves. It meant the same thing, but bond servants feels a little bit better off the tongue, doesn't it? And so, but we are bond servants. We are slaves to the Lord, assigned and distributed and commanded into a life, into a life path by our king, by the master in heaven. Our actions and attitudes and behavior in the home and in the workplace and in the public square and in relaxation and in crisis, it's always supposed to filter through this biblical perspective 
where I recognize that my life is not primarily about how comfortable I am or how secure I am or how successful or prosperous I am. That's not really what my life is about. The point of my life is to receive God's love, be a conduit of his grace, and glorify him in the process. That's the point of your life if you're a Christian. And because this is the biblical perspective, and because God is doing an ongoing eternal work through my life, and because the gospel applies in every generation and in every situation, that means that my circumstances, your circumstances, do not determine who we are or what we should do. Our circumstances don't determine our identity. Our circumstances aren't supposed to drive our decision-making. Circumstances are real, and they matter. They certainly matter to us, and you know what? They matter to the Lord, too. When his people are suffering, when his people are oppressed, when his people are facing difficulty, God cares very much about that because he is a God of tender love and compassion and activity towards his people. Absolutely matters to God, but your circumstances, be they good or bad, are not the determining factor for your life and your walk with the Lord. And we know that because you can walk with Jesus, experience his love, be filled with his grace, be used for his purposes, whether you live in first century Ephesus or 21st century Hanford, whether you live in 21st century uh, Nigeria where Christians are being mowed down by the hundreds on a regular basis, or whether you're in a place of, of wealth and affluence and ease. The gospel always works in every generation and in every place. Why? Because it's not dependent on circumstance. Your life is not defined by how things are going in your physical reality. It's defined by the love of God, the power of God, the work of God that's unfolding in your life. Some of the people listening to Paul's letter that day had very difficult circumstances. Some, not so much. The message for both groups and everybody in between was the same, and it's the same for you and me. Because these are spiritual truths that are being revealed from heaven for all of God's people, not just for some of God's people. Look at verse five. It says, slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. What did it mean to be a slave in Ephesus? Scholars are often quick to point out that slavery wasn't quite the same in the Roman Empire as we think of it from American history. And, in, and, and that, that's true in a sense. Um, for example, people sometimes put themselves into slavery voluntarily to pay debts. We would refer to that as indentured servitude. You know, they didn't have Visa MasterCard the way uh, that we do today. And so people would get into debts. Well, you had to pay your debts. Otherwise, you're going to debtor's prison or things are going to happen. So they would say, okay, I will sell myself into slavery so that I can work off my debt and eventually be free of it. And so that was true. That would happen in many cases in the Roman Empire. On top of that, some data shows that around this time that Paul's writing, 50% of slaves were freed before the age of 30. Not always, but in many cases. Some slaves were cooks or bakers or furniture makers. Some were carpenters or craftsmen. Some were letter carriers. Some musicians or actors or teachers, even physicians. Right, so there were a lot of jobs that sort of fell under this. The word is doulos, the slave category. It was a completely different economy, a completely different culture, a completely different way of humans interacting uh, economically with one another than we're used to. So, so that's true. It wasn't necessarily always plantation slavery like we think from American history. At the same time, it wasn't true for all slaves. Many slaves in the Roman Empire experienced extreme abuse and misery. Slaves working in the mines or the quarries, for example, they worked with no downtime. They died in large numbers on a regular basis. One historian from about this era wrote this, 
about people working in the mines. Death in their eyes is more to be desired than life because of the magnitude of the hardships they must bear. Yeah, that's pretty bad. In a home, things might be just as bad depending on your master, depending on your situation. It was not illegal, it was not a crime for a master to rape his slaves or for his sons to rape their slaves. And some individuals, men and women, were taken as sex slaves into a home and then sent out to others as sex slaves from the home. Not everyone who was a slave in Rome had volunteered for indentured servitude. Many had been kidnapped, like we think of in a classic slave trade. Many had been conquered by Rome and taken. At one point, one of the Roman emperors in, in one conquest took 97,000 Jews and put them all into slavery. You were a person with a life one day, the next day you're a slave and you're not going to be treated well. Ephesus specifically was a hub for the Roman slave trade. And slaves in the, during that time might come from Israel or the Arabian Peninsula or Africa. Slaves came from as far as Ireland or Scotland, Eastern Europe. Those people weren't volunteering to come to Ephesus to be enslaved. And so you have skilled craftsmen working with gold and jewels who signed up for what we would call a, a, effectively a job. They didn't even live in a house somewhere. They lived on their own. T technically, legally, they were slaves, but they're skilled craftsmen that were uh, you know, uh, revered and able to do this beautiful work and they're paying off their debts. debts. And then all the way at the other end of the spectrum, you have people being brutalized and abused after being kidnapped from their homeland. In between those polar opposites, you had jobs that weren't so bad, but weren't so good. There were things you certainly wouldn't do if you were self-employed or if you were the person in charge. For example, and I have been saving this from the very first study that we did in, F in Ephesians. I discovered this in my original research and I've just been keeping it in my pocket for tonight. And maybe you won't care about this, but I found this to be one of the most crazy historical things ever. You may recall that Ephesus had a famous public toilet that was used by people throughout the day, as people do. You can visit the ruins today. You can sit on the seats, though you're asked not to utilize the facility. I have a picture. Jeff, will you put the picture up for us? Okay, so if you can see it. So this is the actual public toilet that was used during the time that Paul wrote this letter. Okay, there were not stalls, right? People would go there and do their business. So Ephesian masters would often send their servants to go down and warm the seats before they came to use the toilet, okay? So there you are, working your regular work in the house. Your master comes down and taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, I got something going on. You need to go down there, head on down. Scope me a seat, warm my seat. And like, this is awful, but archaeologists have done archaeological things with the waste in there. Everybody had, it was rampant parasites, like all, it was awful, right? And so you had to, your job, your job as a slave was to go down and sit on a toilet seat while other people around you a foot away are doing their business. And then someone else comes in and does the same thing. And someone else comes in and does the same thing. And you just have to sit there and wait until your master came to do his business. Now listen, I've plunged a couple of toilets at my job, but I've never had to do that, right? That's a different thing. So this is the range of experience. Some of it silly, some of it very unsilly. And to all of these slaves, Paul says, obey your master as if they were Christ. Now, when he says fear and trembling, he doesn't mean to cower 
as it, you know, and to, and to be freaked out. It, it's a term that means respect. He says, I want you to respect your master. And then he says, I want you to do so from the sincerity of your heart. And so again, we've seen again and again, example after example, that this way of living, this way of walking with the Lord, it's not just going through the motions. It's not just lip service. It's meant to come from the depths of the new life of that heart that God has given us, that we have in Christ, right? The, the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ installed in us by his power when he made us new creations when we were born again. He says, from that place, I want this to well up a respectfulness, and, and a sincerity so that our attitudes and words and behaviors, they're welling up from the fount of grace. Jesus talked about rivers of living water that would flow out of his people. And so, yeah, this is the idea that from my life, a river of respect, a river of sincerity is flowing through me even when my master says, go warm my toilet seat. Sincerity here is a word that means integrity. I want you to work with integrity. It means bountifulness and generosity. So God is commanding them to be generous slaves. What a strange set of words to be put to next to each other. Now, we are not slaves, economically speaking, the way that these people were, though I'm sure some of you feel chained to your desk. I'm sure some of you feel like your boss is a taskmaster. <laughs> But these verses do apply to our life at work, right? You may not love your job. You may want out of your job. You may be overqualified and underappreciated at your job. You may see wrongdoing happening among other people at your workplace. But the Lord God says, okay, listen, stop. You're a Christian in that spot. And the fundamental command God has given you is work respectfully, treating your fellow employees and your boss with grace and generosity because you should think about your job as if you were doing it for Jesus Christ because as far as he is concerned, you are. And in a different spot, when Paul's talking to Timothy about some of these things too, he effectively says, and if your boss is a Christian or if your boss is an idiot, it doesn't matter. Because your activity, your words, your behavior, your choices are being done, directed toward Jesus Christ. Even if you think you're underappreciated, underpaid, overqualified, all of these different things. He says, you're doing this for Jesus. And that's actually really good news. Let's, let's see what else Paul says. He says in verse six, don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. What Paul is saying is not only challenging to us because on average, human beings tend to be a little bit lazy or tend to cut corners or tend to say, well, I'll do more in order to curry favor. I'll do less if I can get away with it. Not everyone, but that's our general perspective. And so it's a challenging to us, but this was also very challenging to the Roman culture. Because you see, guys like Aristotle said, slaves, they're not people, they're living tools. And they had absolutely no legal rights. The things that a master was allowed to do to a slave if they wanted to were absolutely shocking. Culturally and legally, they didn't have the option whether they wanted to obey or not. And here's Paul, he cuts through all of that. And he's speaking under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. And he says, no, no, remember this happened with wives, this happened with children. And Paul says, hey, everybody, Roman culture, everybody else be quiet. I'm talking to you, slaves. I'm talking to you, employees. I'm talking to you, individuals who in this society and in this culture, you have no rights, you have no value, but I don't care about that. I'm talking to you under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you that you are a free moral agent and you are an individual with dignity and value you and you have the capacity to choose whether you will do what God says that you can do or whether you will not choose to do that. And that if you choose to go God's way, all sorts of incredible things are going to happen spiritually speaking in and through your life. And so this is incredibly countercultural. Slaves weren't tools. They were human beings. And we're going to see here in a minute that Paul says, and they're absolutely equal human beings. Everybody's equal. And that's been a message throughout the book of Ephesians. And it wasn't just, hey, have a good attitude. 
Make sure you put a smile on when you're at the workplace. Paul challenges all of us to have the highest quality of work, not just for our own career advancement, but because it is the right thing to do. It is the godly thing to do. And remember, he's talking to people who sometimes their job was to warm toilets for people and people who were medical professionals and people who were carpenters and people who worked in a mine and people who baked things, right? He's talking to all of them equally. He's talking to all of us equally. A lot of different jobs and vocations and careers and backgrounds represented here even right now. And the Lord says, you have value and your job has value. It may not feel like it day to day, but the Lord says, you are able to do spiritual work by doing the job God has given you. Some Roman slaves had super limited or individualized roles. For example, one job might be to, your job as a slave, slave was to drape the toga on your master, right? That was your job. You're like, how do I get that job, right? But that menial, seemingly unnecessary job, let's get real, it's not a necessary job. You know, people can dress themselves. They do it quite well. You know who dressed himself? The slave who dressed himself and then came to drape the toga on this guy. So on, on some level, it's like this is a stupid job that has no value and is menial and unnecessary. And to that person, what is the Lord saying? He says, look, that menial, seemingly an unnecessary job can actually be spiritually glorious because God is that involved in our day-to-day -day experience. He's that interested in our lives. He's that willing to share with us. He says, I'm willing to invest the power of grace, the power of the gospel, all of these things in your job of carrying a letter, of draping a toga, of these different things. That's incredible generosity from God. Now, okay, but what if I was one of the slaves in the mine, right? That today might be my last day because they're working me so hard. What if I'm one of these individuals being sexually exploited? Those are very hard circumstances, very hard questions, very hard realities that some of these people had to face. And there's not always easy answers. What we can do is look to biblical examples. Look at a guy like Joseph in the book of Genesis. He knew something about being abused. He knew something about being enslaved. He knew about being a slave in a cush job and being a slave in the worst job imaginable. You're, you're in a dungeon. It, in a different part of the Bible, it talked about how he had this metal collar and how they hurt him and all these different things. And we see that Joseph was able, under the power of God and because of the presence of God, he was able to deal with these situations where his godliness did clash with his circumstances. It certainly wasn't easy, but he was able to stay true to his faith and be used by God along the way. And we marvel at his story and we're thankful for his story. At the same time, we recognize that he suffered greatly. And we don't wanna just overlook that. Who cares, big deal. No, he suffered seriously. And he had very hard days for years and years. And it's not that God wanted him to suffer. God's not pleased by seeing his people suffer. But that difficult road, we know from reading the story, led to the salvation of thousands of people in the region around Egypt and within Egypt itself, not to mention the preservation of the family of faith which was instrumental in bringing you and, uh, you and me the Messiah, right? And so he's an Old Testament example of a New Testament reality that God's strength for us is made perfect, not in our comfort, not in our ease. Where is God's strength made perfect? In our weakness. Now, if we're designing a religion, that's not what we design for ourselves, we say, well, I would like God's strength to be made perfect through my affluence, through my security, through my ease, through my promotion, through all of those things. And I, and I get it. It's nicer to have it better than to have it worse. But God comes along and he says, listen, in this time, in this dispensation, my strength is going to be made perfect in your weakness. I'm going to use you to shine light in the dark. I'm going to show 
through your life that you cannot stop the gospel, that you cannot crush the work of God, that you cannot overcome the power of his love through difficulty, through oppression, through opposition, through these different things. Now, that's one reason why Paul didn't say to them, just escape your slavery. Sometimes people escape their slavery. Paul didn't say, hey, do whatever you can to escape your slavery. In fact, some say, well, why, doesn't, why didn't the New Testament writers come out more strongly against slavery? Some go as far as saying blasphemously that the Bible endorses slavery and likes slavery. Bill Maher is famous for this. That the Bible is a handbook for slavery and it loves slavery. And no one, even Jesus, never said anything against slavery. That's not actually true. And Bill, you've never read the Bible, so... I would love for a real Christian to talk to him for two or three minutes, but uh, you know, whatever. But the Bible doesn't endorse slavery. What Paul recognizes is that slavery was a reality in their time and it wasn't gonna go away anytime soon, not societally, right? Just like having to work is a reality for the vast majority of people in our experience, right? It's not that they're the same things, it's that what is the reality? The reality is that you go to work because if you don't go to work, you're gonna have a problem. The reality for these people is that a bunch of them were slaves. And so in that case, we say, okay, well, if that's the reality, how then should we behave? How then should we proceed? And the fact of the matter is God does scatter his people into all of these different places and corners so that the gospel light can shine. Right, the Lord in a sense, the Lord wants a Christian in the mine. He wants a Christian in the carpenter shop. He wants a Christian in the household because he's trying to save as many people as he can. He's trying to save those other mine workers. He's trying to save the foreman. He's trying to save the people at the toilet, right? And he says, yeah, I scatter Christians throughout time and all over the earth so that we can proclaim the gospel and demonstrate to a lost and dying world who Jesus is and what he does. And so God scatters. And we also know that the gospel does lead to the abolition of slavery. We've seen that in history very clearly. And we'll see elements of it in our text too, right? So the Bible does not endorse slavery. It addresses the reality of these cultures that they were in. Now, Paul is talking about here and now Christianity in practice. And he says, okay, you are slaves. Here's the way you should slave. And now if you could buy your freedom, great. If your master wanted to free you, Paul didn't say, no, 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 stay as a slave, because God wants you to suffer. That's not the case. But it was always about glorifying the Lord and doing what was godly, even if your circumstances weren't good or ideal. Paul met once met this guy named Onesimus. He became like a son to Paul. Paul was an old man. He needed help. And he was so helped by Onesimus and they became such close friends that Paul said, man, I want you to stay and be like a son to me and help me and just let's hang out. It was a great relationship. And then he found out that Onesimus was actually a runaway slave. He said, oh, okay. Uh, the right thing for you to do, the godly thing for you to do is to go back and present yourself to your master. Wow. Now, luckily, his master was a Christian and Paul even knew him. But that's how serious Paul was about not reacting to circumstances, but instead living with Christian character in every circumstance. Go back to the slavery you escaped and be a Christian there. And if you're gonna be free, to be freed the right way. That's a serious calling. That's a seriously high bar. And Paul looks at all of us in the face. He says, yeah, that's right. That's Christian living. That's Christian application godliness, no matter what our circumstances are. If you're a Christian, the goal of your life is not the exaltation of yourself. The goal of your life is the exaltation of Jesus Christ in whatever circumstance you find yourself in. Verse seven, serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. So for like the millionth time, Paul says, as to the Lord, 
Like every verse in this section, as to the Lord, as to the Lord, as to the Lord, it's about you and the Lord, it's about you and Jesus. You're not actually working for your boss. You're working for Jesus. You're not actually just a cog at your company. You're an emissary of Christ's kingdom on location. Yeah, everybody wants to be stationed in Hawaii, but Lamore needs staff, right? <laughs> if you're a Navy person or worked on base, you get it, right? Nobody's like, I can't wait to be stationed at LNAS. But LNAS needs staff. We understand that. Yeah, you, we, we need people there. It's part of the big work that's happening. And so the Lord says, I'm scattering people throughout the earth because I'm doing a global work. In verse eight, we see here, Paul includes free citizens too. It's not just a slave thing. It's a Christian thing. And though a Christian may be unre unrecognized or undercompensated, the Lord promises here to reward our day-to-day -day faithfulness at your job He'll, he says, I'll, re I'll reward you. If you're faithful, he's like, well, but Lord, I'm not doing ministry at my job. I'm, you know, I'm doing this or that or the other thing. He says, yeah, no, that counts. I want you to be faithful in that place I've scattered you to. I want you to be a Christian on the line at the factory. I want you to be a Christian on the shift here or there or whatever. And as you do your work faithfully and respectfully and generously towards others, I count that as ministry in fact, you're doing the will of God, Paul says in this section. We talk about, I wanna do God's will in my life. And, and, and the Lord says, part of my will is that you be a faithful worker at the job that you have. Well, how does that work? And the Lord says, if you're faithful to go warm a toilet seat, in that case, that is my will. And you are doing my will. In Colossians 3 and 4, Paul says very similar things as we're reading here, but he, there he says, hey, by the way, the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done. And so what we notice is that God is watching. He cares about our conduct. He pays attention to the things we do and the things done to us. You may have a terrible boss who doesn't treat you right. In the end, God will hold them accountable. He's keeping track. But meanwhile, we are to keep a biblical perspective and to recognize that your boss isn't the problem. In fact, your boss is an opportunity. They are a potential sibling in the family of God. And your behavior, your witness, your experience may be the one demonstration of gospel grace that they see. They're not a problem, they're an opportunity. One of the important things we learn here is that oppression is not an excuse for wrongdoing. That is a very pervasive and popular idea in our culture right now, right? If I decide I'm oppressed, then I'm excused for bad behavior or lashing out or abandoning my duties. But that's not godly. It's not the Christian way. Now, slavery wasn't a good thing. But for the Ephesians, their work situation was an opportunity to exercise faith day by day. Did they believe God was in charge? Did they believe that he was watching out for them? Did they believe that vengeance belongs to the Lord? Did they believe that the best is yet to come? Did they believe that life was not defined by circumstances, but by the power of God? And for some of these people, it's a very hard ask. And we never want to minimize suffering. God doesn't minimize suffering, but suffering is a reality for God's people some to an extreme degree, some not so extreme a degree. Because we live in a fallen world, a world held captive by the devil, a world ruined by sin. And the Lord says, I am going to fix everything one day. Meanwhile, I'm trying to rescue as many people as I can along the way. I'm trying to pull as many people out of the rubble before we repave this thing. And so would they believe what God had said? It shouldn't be as hard for us in our experience as it was for some of these Ephesian slaves. Though I recognize that some of you face very hard things at work, difficulties and, 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 and hardships. I recognize that. We're not making light of that. But the question is, do we believe God that my work is really about me doing it for Jesus, that I can be gracious and diligent even when my circumstances aren't good? Do I believe that the Lord is looking out for me or do I think it's all on me to make things better? It's all on me to demand all of my rights, take revenge for the wrongs done to me one way or another. 
In the final verse, Paul turns to masters. Verse nine, masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. So some commentators, commentators love to say, well, Paul didn't have much to say to masters because there were so few attending the church. We don't know that. Notice what the beginning of the verse says. Masters, treat your slaves the same way. So verses five through eight apply to masters and verse nine applies to masters. So he tells them, hey, by the way, you Roman masters, in addition to being respectful and generous and having the proper perspective on who you're really serving in the day-to-day -day life, you need to give up the threat of violence against your slaves and servants. Frank Thielman writes, with these words, Paul has cut the thread that held the institution of slavery together. And it's true. You take that away and slavery as an institution is going to die because the threat of violence was all masters had to make slaves obey in a Roman culture or in any culture, right? But Paul comes and he reprograms the perspective here too. And he says, no, 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 no. Your slave is not your property. They aren't a living tool. They aren't a tea cozy to warm up your toilet seat. They are just like you. And guess what? You also are a slave. You have a master in heaven who you are supposed to be serving and he sees everything you're doing and he sees every single person as equal. This is the end of slavery if you're an owner, right? When Paul wrote to Onesimus' owner, his name is Philemon, you can read his book in the New Testament, he told the owner, I want you to receive Onesimus back into his job as a slave, but you are no longer to think of him as a slave. He is much more than a slave. He is your brother, and he's not just your brother. He is a dearly loved brother. You can read that in Philemon verse 16. When Paul here says without threatening, it not only means don't threaten to hurt your slaves and employees anymore. It literally means you need to loosen up. And there's a, there's a way of it, this word being used where it talks about neglect. You can't be neglecting your slaves anymore. You need to loosen up. You need to show them kindness. For the first time ever in this culture, masters had a moral responsibility to their slaves. That was incredibly countercultural. It would require <clears throat> serious dedication and change of heart for a Roman owner. It would require a Roman owner saying, okay, I reject my culture, I reject what the world around me says about this relationship, and instead I see things this way. Ben Witherington writes, both parties, slaves and owners, are called to be proactive, not reactive to their situations. In both cases, their eyes must be on the Lord and on how to please him. To do so, they must ignore what culture said. They abandoned the Roman ideas of how this relationship was supposed to work. And instead, it was all about my duty to Christ and how I can be flowing in grace toward others, whether my society says they are of lower or higher standard or not. Because Jesus says, no, everybody's the same. Everybody's equal. Now, of course, not all masters are Christians. Not all slaves are Christians. But these callings, like we've seen with husbands and wives, parents and children, these callings weren't about whether the other person was a believer and doing what they should. It was about your life, your choices. As a slave, you're gonna have to set aside some of the wrongs done to you. As a master, you are gonna have to set aside a lot of your rights. But God said, if you do this, I'm glorified, lives are changed, reward is waiting for you. This is the way that we're gonna do things. And so now for you and me, we live in a culture obsessed with personal freedom and personal rights. We live in a time when it's accepted and expected for everyone to just sue their way out of discomfort. We live in a society where anytime we feel unhappy, one of the first solutions is to just pull the ripcord, find a different job, change our circumstances, escape as quickly as possible. But these are not actually biblical answers. Now God may want you to change jobs. That's his business and yours. But Ephesians chapter six reveals that your circumstances are not the determining factor of what you should do. Earthly circumstances may be hard, they may discourage you or deflate you, but they do not define you. You are defined by your relationship with Jesus Christ and the callings he puts on your life and the power of God and the specific path he has carved out for you to discover and walk in. And as we walk, God tells us, by the way, my strength is gonna be made perfect in your weakness on this road. 
But you know, that's good news because we do face difficulties. We are surrounded by non-believers who don't treat us the way we want to be treated. And so what a wonderful thing to know that the Lord is like, yeah, I know. And your nine to five has value and worth and dignity and eternal weight. That our faithfulness in small, seemingly menial things counts as doing God's will. And that he's going to reward us for it. We can be excited about whatever we are, are called to do, whatever our vocation is, because God says, I'm with you. And you're doing it for me after all. And I'm watching and I count it. I count your shift job as ministry to me, as doing my will. I count your career. I count all of these things. I count it as if you're serving me because you are serving me. Our part is the perspective, which should make us the best workers in whatever job we have. We recognize that we are children of God and friends of God, but we also want to be like the apostles and identify ourselves as the slaves of God. Or we can use bond servants if that feels better. It may not make every circumstance feel good or easy, but it does keep our purpose to the forefront. It keeps the spiritual reality right in front of us. And it gives us a rudder and fuel and spiritual navigation for daily lives, especially when circumstances are not what we would call up for ourselves. But the Lord is with us and he cares about even these small, seemingly menial day-to-day -day things. And he says, I can use that, I can infuse that, I can glorify myself through that. Do you wanna do that with me?